Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, page 851. Remember the instruction of Moses, my servant, the statutes and ordinances I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Look, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he'll turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our final words need to be simple words. The final words you use should probably be simple because they are the words you are going to be remembered for. They're words that will summarise, capture, maybe reinforce. Think about some of the final words we have recorded in the New Testament. As Jesus dies in John 19, verse 30, he says very simply one word. In English, three words. It is finished. That's simple, isn't it? As the thief dies on the cross in Luke 23, verse 42, very simple words. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Simple words, aren't they? Simple words that you can remember, that summarise, capture and reinforce. Malachi is no different. These are the last words we have of Malachi. All we know about this man is his name. But Malachi breaks with the pattern of the book in these last three verses. His final words, the final words of the whole Old Testament are very simple. They're very clear and they capture the essence of of this last communication from God before 400 years of silence. And we're going to look at them this morning. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Your word is the revelation of your nature. Uh, It is breathed out by you so that we can know who you are, your essence, your your character, your plans, your desires. Uh, Father, thank you that we can open your word. Father, thank you that your word is true and active and exposes and reveals. Father, please do that with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Malachi spoke to God's people at a fairly grim time in their history. Cast your mind back five or six weeks, sometime after 516 BC. God's mob had been out of their land for a while and they'd returned to the land that God had promised them and it was nothing that they had hoped for. Life is hard and grey on every level, socially, relationally, economically. There seems to be no goodness in being God's people. Just look at how small their temple is, that picture of how much God wants to dwell with them. And their very existence just seems insignificant. Everywhere they look, They see people getting ahead in life who are not in God's mob. Why would you bother? Well, Malachi comes with words to God's mob. We only know one thing about this man, his name, uh, in a very regular pattern of an accusation, a response and an application. Malachi continually reminds God's mob of who they are. They belong to God. They're in a relationship with God, an exclusive relationship called a covenant. And as Malachi brings God's word in this way, we're also showing the state of God's mob, aren't we, in those responses? Uh, It's full of shoulder shrugs and rolled eyes. They doubt God's love. They doubt their identity in him. They doubt that it's actually worth living as God's mob if there's any goodness in it. And so they live in that way in the world where they are. And Malachi reminds them again and again of that truth from Malachi chapter 1, verse 2. God loves you. God loves you. God is relentless, faithful, unstoppable, consistent in his love for you. That's the substance of your nature. That's the guts of his covenant with you. And they doubt whether God actually does that. They doubt whether God's love is true or relevant or real, even good. And so as he finishes in his last three verses, Malachi summarises the two key themes of the book in very simple words. I'm at point two on the outline. Look at verse four. Remember the instruction of Moses, my servant, the statutes and ordinances I commanded him at Horeb 
for all of Israel. The command's very simple. One word, remember. It's not a go and find a rock to sit on and scratch your chin and look at the clouds and ponder something. Uh, Whenever God uses this word, he means listen and obey. Listen and obey. You're not really listening, are you, if you don't obey? (laughs) And doing something without listening beforehand isn't really doing anything important in that sense, is it? And the remembering command is connected with a specific event. Did you see that there in verse 4? God's more about to remember a person, Moses. Moses who led them out of Egypt when they were slaves. God's more about to remember a place, Horeb. That's Mount Sinai. God's more about to remember a moment. They're to remember a moment when they received, did you see their instruction, statute, ordinance. God's more but to remember that at that mountain with Moses leading them, they were made God's people in a covenant. They were made his mob. And do you notice there in verse 4 who it applies to? All, all of Israel. In essence, Malachi is saying, remember your identity as God's mob. Remember your identity as God's mob. And we can understand that a little more clearly if we go back to the account of that in Exodus chapter 19. It's up here on the overhead. I'm going to bring any Bible verses we go to up here on the overhead. In the third month, on the same day of the month that the Israelites had left the land of Egypt, they entered the wilderness of Sinai. After they departed from Rephidim, they entered the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Moses went up the mountain to God. And the Lord called to him from the mountain, this is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to me. Now, if you listen to me and carefully keep my covenant, you'll be my own possession out of all the peoples, although all the earth is mine. You'll be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. After Moses came back, he summoned the elders of the people and put before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. Then all the people responded together, we will do all that the Lord has spoken. So Moses brought the people's words back to the Lord. This is the moment Malachi wants you to go to. This is the moment Malachi wants you to remember. Remember Moses, remember this day, remember this place, remember these commands. And as they do, they'll remember who they are. Notice there in verse 4, they're God's mob by his grace. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to me. This moment comes after they're saved. They don't go through this moment to be saved. They were slaves. They could do nothing. They owned nothing. They earned nothing. And God said, you're my mob, I'm going to save you. And he takes them out of Egypt in a way that is amazing. God achieves all of their salvation for them. And they trust him to achieve this. And when God saved them, God brought them, if you see there in verse 5, to a covenant, a binding agreement to him. He is their God, they are his mob. They are literally married together exclusively and his kindness has achieved this. And in that covenant, look there in verse 5, do you notice what they will do? They will listen and keep. Remember that word, remember? They'll listen and obey. And when they do that, they're remembering who they are before God. And they've got a job to do as they do that. Look there in verse 6. You'll be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. Their job is to stand in front of the world and say to the whole world as they live in obedience, do you know how good God is? And when the world looks at his people, they'll go, look how good God is. As they display his character in their obedience. Because what comes in Exodus 20? Well, the Ten Commandments. 
Here's how you are to show God to the world. Obey these commandments and you'll show God to the world. Now, don't obey these commandments to be God's people. You already are. But as you obey these commandments, you'll show that God is unique. God is kind. God is trustworthy. God keeps his promises. God doesn't covet. God doesn't steal. God is faithful. God gives you rest. God gives you work. And as you obey those commands in this covenant with God, having already been saved by grace, the world will look at you and go, how good is God? And do you notice how many of them agree to do it? Down there in verse 8. All of them say we'll do all of it. (laughs) And so when Malachi says, remember Moses, Malachi is taking them to this passage and say, remember who you are. God saved you by grace because he loved you. God did that so that you could be his mob alone in a covenant, so that you could display him by obedience to the world, so the world would know how good God is and this is all of you. You are God's mob. And so it's a summary of that main theme of the book, isn't it? Who are you? You're God's book. God loves you. And when you go back over the book, you'll see it everywhere. God loves you relentlessly. God's given you an identity to reflect to the world. God deserves your best, not your seconds. You are to display that in the covenant of marriage. God is not disinterested in you and God is just and will deal with sin. God's mob will depend upon him knowing how generous he is. And last week, it's the best life ever. It doesn't get better than this. Remember Moses. Remember who you are. And the consistent response of God's people, I'm at point three on the outline, the consistent response of God's people, remember all of those interjections? How have you loved us? How have our words tied you out? How have we offered you our second? The consistent response of God's people shows that they doubt God. They despise his name. They deny his love. They denigrate his nature. They don't think God is interested. They think living life as God's mob is second best. And so that brings to the fore the second theme that Malachi wants to summarize. Look there in verse 5. Look, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. God's mob consistently doubt, despise, deny, and do not display him to the world. They doubt his nature, they doubt his love. And God has consistently called them back. He sent men and women called prophets, hasn't he? And they've come time and time again. Malachi is the last one. Come back, come back, come back. And they continue to debate him and deny him. Even the fact that they can stand there and argue with him shows how good he is. And God has said, there's going to be a day coming. Remember Malachi 3.1, where I'm going to send the last prophet. And when that last prophet comes, I'm coming hot on his heels. And when I come on his heels, I will judge sin in my mob. Even then, God's generosity shines through because he sends someone to prepare them. (laughs) He doesn't want them to be caught unawares. And that is a great and awesome day of the Lord. And you know, notice here he says, look for that day. He says, look for another person. Remember Moses, look for who? Look there in verse 5. Who are they to look for? Elijah. Why Elijah? Of all the prophets to pick, we don't even have a book in the Bible called Elijah. Why would you pick Elijah? Well, he was a prophet, but he worked in a very similar time, 1 Kings 17 and following. He worked in a time where God's people were discontented. They doubted God's love. They denied the nature of God and they followed their own way. Who was the king at that time? It was Ahab. Ahab had a corker of a wife. Her name was Jezebel. You know Jezebel, don't you? And things had gotten so bad in those days that there was only one follower of God left. What was his name? Elijah. It had gotten that bad and Elijah continually put God in front of God's people and God's mob said, no, we doubt the love of God. We despise him. And Elijah spoke God's word to God's people. Elijah called God's people back. Elijah reminded, reminded, and reminded. And one day, God just took Elijah away. He didn't die. God just took him. And God said, he's coming back. And when he comes back, 
Get ready for the great and awesome day of the Lord. It's going to be a great day for those people who repented. Remember Phil talked about them last week in verse 16 of chapter 3? There are some who listen. It's going to be a great day when God comes back. It's going to be an awesome day for others. Now, that's not awesome as in they're the best hot chips I've ever had. That's a silly way to use awesome. It'll be awesome because you will be filled with awe and terror because there are no more reminders. There are no more reminders. And for those who've ignored the reminders, they will be burnt up. And that's the second thing. There will be a day that is coming where God will judge sin starting with his mob. And do you notice what that Elijah person will do in verse 6? I'm at point 4 on the outline. He'll turn the hearts of fathers to their children, the hearts of children to their fathers, otherwise I will come and strike the land with a curse. When that Elijah figure comes, he will turn hearts back, repent, back to God, and relationships within God's people will be restored. And they will actually do the job they were given. And if they don't repent, what will happen? Did you see that there in the last phrase in verse 6? I'll come and strike the land with a curse. Malachi's final words. I'm at point five on the outline. Malachi's final words are very simple words that summarize the theme of the book. Remember, be reminded. Remember Moses. Be reminded by Elijah. And as you remember and are reminded, repent and be restored. Remember, remind, repent, restore. And then God's silent for 400 years. Doesn't say a word. God says nothing. And then at a certain point, someone comes In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent because the kingdom of heaven has come near. John himself had a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Then people from Jerusalem, all Judea, all the vicinity of the Jordan were flocking to him. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. Looks like a prophet, smells like a prophet, eats like a prophet, talks like a prophet. Then he is a prophet. That's why they all come out, because they haven't seen one of these for 400 years. And you notice his message, what is it? Repent. Well, we've heard that before, haven't we? And you notice what the hearts of the people do there in the last verse? They confess their sins, their hearts were turned back. And if you are someone who is aware at this point, you're kind of going, hey, this sounds and looks and smells and talks like who? Elijah. And then hot on his heels comes someone else. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be what? Baptised by him. Remember Malachi 3.1, I'll send this bloke and hot on his heels, who's coming? God himself. And so you put three and two together and you come up with five and you go, this must be God. And when Jesus starts speaking, what does he say? From then on, Jesus began to preach. There's that word again, repent. Because the kingdom of heaven has come near. The same message. And when he does get his group together, what does he say to them? Don't assume that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to fulfill. Jesus remembers. He's the only one who remembers perfectly. He's the only one who ever does Exodus 19 perfectly. He does everything that God said. He remembers Moses the ordinances, laws, and statutes. And what does he do? He obeys them perfectly. And he shows God perfectly to the world so that when we meet Jesus face to face, when we meet him face to face as he truly is on another mountain, he was transformed in front of them. His face shone like the sun. Even his clothes became as white as the light. Suddenly, who's standing with Jesus? Moses and Elijah, the people we're meant to be looking for. And Jesus is talking to them. Jesus is Malachi 4, 4 4-6. He remembers. He reminds. 
And because Jesus remembers and reminds and does that perfectly, he then receives all of the judgment of God for the sins of God's people, like God said he would. The great and awesome day is there at the cross, isn't it? When God himself visits all the judgment his people deserve for their sins on who? On himself. Because he loves his people. And so anyone who trusts in that can be restored, can come back to God and wait for when that guy comes back again on another final great and awesome day. Well, the Old Testament finishes with some simple words, doesn't it? We're at the last point on the outline. Remember, be reminded, repent, restore. Nothing complicated about it for God's people then or now. Same words apply to us, don't they? Now you'll see them there on your outline. I'm at the last point. Remember, let me plead with you to remember who you are. Remember your identity. Like every one of God's people in every age, we are the same. We are saved by grace because God relentlessly loves us into a unique relationship with him so that being saved, we can obey him and show God to the world and say, look how good God is. We're God's mom. God is relentlessly loving towards us. God has given us his best and deserves our firsts. Our identity is in him and he is deeply interested, generous and consistent so that God's mob have the best life now and it will be even better then. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, who are you? You're in God's mob relentlessly loved by God. You are not going to miss out on anything tomorrow by being in God's mind. You are not going to miss out on anything in the future by being in God's mind. God is not going to deprive you of anything because he relentlessly loves you. Who are you? You're in God's mind. Now go and show him to the world. How good is our God? By obeying him. Because there is a day coming. It is more certain than your death. It is more certain than your taxes. And it will be great and awesome. It will be great for those who have depended upon the man who remembered perfectly. Your verdict is already sorted. It's assured. It's final because Jesus remembered Moses perfectly and turned our hearts back. We we can live as a restored community. Do we remind each other of that? I remember Phil helped us think about that last week. What words do we use? Do we remind each other that this is good? We're not missing out on anything being in God's mind. Not a thing. It is good. And it will be even better. (laughs) but we also need to remind each other by looking out for each other. Uh, Have a look around. Is there someone who's missing today? Someone who's not here? Someone who might be worn out, struggling with the goodness of being in God's people? Is there someone who hasn't been here for a while? Is there someone we need to remind, to ring, to send a message to, to maybe cook a cake and go and have a cuppa with and say, how good is it to be in God's mind? But let me also ask you, let me also ask you, if you don't trust in Jesus, what are you going to do when that day is awesome? Listen to the reminders. Listen to how good it is to have a king who remembered for us so that that day will be great. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word.
Thank you for your goodness to us, our Father. We are not deprived of anything following you. In fact, you've provided everything. Thank you for your relentless love. Remind us of this daily. Remind us of the goodness of following you. And Father, in our obedience to you, help us to show the world how good you are. Father, make us not only a remembering people but a reminding people. A people who remind each other over morning tea or during the week with coffees and meals and cups of tea and cakes and phone calls and letters and cards and flowers with even just visits of how good it is to know Jesus who remembered Moses for us. Father, thank you that you love us in Jesus' name. Amen.